let's uh, go ahead. Okay, great. So welcome everybody. Thank you very much for joining us for this uh, second part of our series of getting ZEVs, uh, zero emissions vehicles into our neighborhoods. Um, this is a small group today, so we are hoping it's going to be a, a dynamic question and answer. Um, at the end, we'll give you the option to either ask the questions yourselves, um, or you can put it in the chat box as the presentation's going on and um, we can ask the question for you, whatever you decide. Um, during the presentation, you will all be muted so we can avoid the background noise um, interfering with the presentation. As we're a small group, it'd be really nice for us to know who is here. Um, it would help Joe Gwynn, who is going to be doing the presentation, to know who's here. We're hoping to have representation from at least three of the entities that we're, we're, we're targeting today, which is garbage collection vehicles, uh, bucket trucks, and ambulances. So um, as we, we can probably go down the list, we've got Bill Watkins, um, welcome. Which entity are you representing? Uh, Public Works Town of Coventry. Wonderful. Mike Skako. Public Works Bloomfield, Connecticut. And please correct me, anyone, if I'm mispronouncing your name. Craig Peters. Yes, good morning. Uh, Craig Peters with Capital Clean Cities of Connecticut. We have Julie Payne Miller. Hi there, uh, I'm representing Payne's Recycling and Rubbish Removal. Uh, we have just Mike. I, it's, uh, otherwise we have Mike Di Taranto. Uh, are those two separate mics? Oh no, I got a mic, I got it just Mike. So um, it might be two, uh, I'll ask Mike Di Taranto to unmute. How are you doing? I'm with the town of West Hartford. Excellent. Um, well, how, about the, how about the other one that's just Mike? Anybody that, that just signed on as Mike without a last name? I guess not. Okay. Uh, what about Vincent Stetson? Good afternoon, guys. I'm with the town of South Windsor. I think we got everybody, I think. Okay, excellent. Great. So um, we can begin when you're ready, Joe. And at the end, we'll have the question and answer. We should have plenty of time for, for getting into the nitty picky of uh, details of these vehicles and funding, etc. All right. Well, thank you, Stephanie. And uh, thank you, Jose. Thanks for hosting me. Um, thanks for everyone who's in attendance. My name is Joe Gwen. I'm with the Lion Electric Company. Um, and we're an all electric commercial vehicle manufacturer of uh, electric vehicles. And uh, um, you can see kind of some of our spread right here on the front. Um, I am the uh, regional sales manager for the Northeast US. So I'm covering everything from uh, Maine down to uh, over to Pennsylvania down to to Virginia. Um, the uh, uh, my background uh, is you know I have a strong engineering background and I've been in sales for several years and uh, specifically the EV sales space for um, about a little over three years. Um, and you know like we say at Lion a year <laughs> a year in the EV space is like ten years anywhere else because of how rapidly everything changes. So, um, you know, everything, I've got a lot of slides here to get through. Uh, like Stephanie said, type in, you know, any questions you have during the presentation um, and uh, we'll address it at the end or you can ask your question at the end uh, and that'll help me get through a lot of this information. I'd also say uh, a lot of the information in here um, is not absolute. It's just what we have today. A lot of things change quickly. Um, so. Uh, keep that in mind too. And uh, I will dive in here. So just give you a brief intro on who Lion is. Uh, we have three over 300 vehicles in operation today. You'll see a school bus here um, because that's really our legacy. Uh, electric school buses is what we've been doing for uh, about five years. And uh, that's the majority of our vehicles on the road. Um, mostly deployed uh, California. We've got some in the Midwest. 
and a lot in Canada. Um, so uh, that tells you it's great in cold weather if we're deploying a lot of these to Canada. Um, it's also, uh, you know, a very reliable and tested solution if, you know, it's something that we put on a school bus with children. Uh, so that's, that's an important thing to note. Now, it was just last year that we started making trucks. We had developed a fully electric chassis platform for buses and thought, you know, where else can we apply this? And the trucking industry makes a ton of sense. It's really our thought that um, we will, you know, truck sales are probably going to start surpassing school bus sales in, I mean, a year or less. Um, so today we're kind of bus company that makes trucks, but give it a year, we'll be a truck company that makes buses. Uh, so uh, we, we, between these 300 vehicles, we have more than 6 million miles. Uh, and that is pretty significant if you consider this number of vehicles and on buses, major, the majority of them are on buses uh, that don't operate in the summer and their routes um, are pretty limited in town. So uh, that means we have great uptime uh, and these vehicles are getting a lot of use. Uh, we have current capacity, manufacturing capacity, 2,500 electric vehicles per year. Um, that's out of our uh, Montreal area um, where that facility is. Now we are uh, expanding into the US. We've made announcements of going public uh, and a lot of other things like battery manufacturing and all this. But part of our going public um, is an announcement we made about a US manufacturing plant. Um, and that will, will happen next year uh, that we'll be manufacturing our vehicles in the US, uh, our trucks specifically, in a highly automated uh, manufacturing plant. Um, and currently we've got 450 employees. Um, that's growing rapidly as well. I think it doubles about every year. Um, here's our current footprint across the US and Canada. Uh, it shows these are what we call experience or service centers. We have vehicles that are parked there. We have service techs who can operate out of there. Um, you see, we'll, uh, we've got one in Albany and one in South Plainfield here in the east. Now uh, you'll see a gray one because that is a planned uh, installation for Connecticut because um, Connecticut's gonna be a big growth area for us. Uh, and uh, we're making the investment to put a service uh, center and experience center there. This is our product roadmap that shows you kind of what's available today and then what is uh, you know, coming out in this year and then what's coming out next year. Um, the, so today um, we have the Lion 6 truck, Lion 8 truck, Lion 8 reefer, Lion 8 refuse truck. Um, that is the one pictured here is a side load, but we can also do rear load. Uh, and other waste applications like roll-off trucks or stake bed trucks. Um, and then I, I won't talk much about bus because I'm not on the bus side, uh, but these are our bus products um, shown here. Now, on uh, I'm giving a presentation tomorrow on this Lion 8 tractor. Um, so that is available. Uh, that is a, a, a very exciting product for it. So. Um, if anyone's interested in hearing a presentation solely on tractors, uh, we can share that link at the end of this presentation. The, uh, it's at 1 p.m. tomorrow. So I know it's kind of short notice, but if anyone's interested, hop on. Uh, the Lion 8 bucket has now been released. We had a big press release uh, last week, I believe it was, um, about our first customer. Con Edison has ordered one of these um, that they're gonna be deploying right in my neck of the woods uh, here in New York. And uh, that's an exciting development for us. Um, and I think that's gonna be a really big product for us. Now, some other ones that are upcoming, Lion 5, because um, right now our smallest uh, vehicle is a class six. The Lion 5 will be something that comes out next year. We'll have a Lion 8 boom truck, um, Lion D bus, Lion 6 utility truck, and uh, the Lion 7, to fill that space between the Lion 6 and 8, it will be another one that comes out next year. And uh, our ambulance too. And I don't know a lot about the ambulance I can share today because as you can see, this is you know, last one on the list, pushing 2022. I just know it is a product that uh, we are planning on releasing next year. 
so that's, that's kind of all the information I have on the ambulance today. Um, this is more specific to trucks. I can kind of skip over this. But um, the, the big thing that sets us apart, I think, uh, in the EV world is that we build our own chassis and cab. Um, and we're, we're really purpose built to be electric from the beginning. We make the whole chassis around uh, with the intention of it being electric. Uh, now, there's a lot of other you know, manufacturers out there that are doing retrofits and things that you know, take something that was designed for a diesel engine and you know, make it work for electric, uh, but it's, it's not the best solution. You don't get the you know, best payload. You don't get the, the best uh, chassis wear because you're changing the weight profile when you do that. And it's not just the chassis is not designed for that. So um, our chassis and, and our cab and everything is designed for electric uh, with electric in mind from the beginning. Um, we have a composite cab, so there's no rust or corrosion. Uh, brakes last three times longer uh, than a conventional vehicle because we have regenerative braking um, that, that powers, that helps re recover lost energy, basically. If you're going downhill or uh, coasting, it will put more energy back into the battery packs. Um, and uh, we also have custom built driver information center and, and our own instrument clusters that are more, you know, focused on what you want to know about an electric vehicle, uh, range, you know, miles per kilowatt, things like that. Um, some of the advantages of electrification, uh, and, and a lot of people know this stuff, but, you know, in case you don't, there's zero emission solution. It's a zero, completely zero emission solution. Um, the, it's the lowest total cost of ownership because your maintenance, uh, there's not much of it. And there's, uh, very, very low fuel costs too. So um, there's no noise pollution. There's, you know, again, lowest maintenance and there's the best in class driving experience and it's safe. It's safer than in a vehicle that is carrying a combustible fuel on it. Uh, so, um, and, you know, safe, safer for your lungs, uh, safer in a lot of ways, just because of all the data you can get from an electric vehicle. Um, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, this is, you know, this is why we're in the space that we're in. Uh, we, we have the potential to have more impact um, than any other electric vehicle vocation. Um, you know, a lot of people are really interested in electric cars and, and this, now they're gonna reduce a lot of uh, CO2 by those measures, but with uh, uh, our vehicle sizes, we're normally gonna be replacing diesel vehicles and diesel vehicles, are um, some of the you know worst uh, offenders of you know affecting public health. Um, so and, and then you know not even to mention greenhouse gases that affect climate change or anything like that. So um, we really think that uh, you know we're doing the right thing by being in this you know space that's exclusively been for diesel uh, for years and also. You know, some of the newer diesels with emission restrictions don't run as well as the old ones. Uh, they they run cleaner, but they don't run as well. Um, so they have issues that uh, that we can really um, help uh, with electric. Now, uh, this kind of gives you an idea of you know how wide reaching and how many different departments Lion has um, that can help because it's not just a new vehicle, there's infrastructure, there's grants, there's you know, service, and, and there's a lot to learn. So we have our own grant team that um, can help customers secure funding. In Connecticut, there's an upcoming round of VW funding. Uh, there's federal grants. Um, now that's not to say a grant is really required to justify the purchase. Um, I, you know, I can show return on investments um, you know, numbers based off your current fleet that will show you it's, it makes sense to switch to electric um, today without incentive, uh, but the initial purchase price is still more than most fleets have, you know, in their budget because they haven't been buying electric vehicles um, and they haven't kind of wrapped their head around, yeah, it's an investment in saving a lot down the line, but uh, that's why we lean a little bit on the grant side um, sometimes, but like I said, it's not a requirement to justify uh, the cost. Lion Energy, they can help with any infrastructure hurdles. Um, there's also incentives out there 
for you know uh, any kind of infrastructure projects. But um, I think uh, you know on a case by case we'll look at that. But I think what's really important is that with the Lion Energy team, we can help make sense of it all. Um, tell you you know what you need depending on how fast you want to charge what your existing infrastructure looks like um, and, and we can make it completely turnkey we are the authorized seller of uh, reseller of nine different brands of charging stations so just about anything you need we've got um, we also have the lion academy that provides training for mechanics drivers and fleet staff uh, and myself as well i'm on lion academy all the time uh, we've got lion beat that is a telematics uh, division because uh, telematics on EVs, there's just more data uh, that we can get. Um, things like uh, efficiencies, driver behaviors, all kinds of things. Um, you know, we, we, uh, we've partnered with Geotab um, in offering a, a Lion Beat solution that's specific to our vehicles. Uh, we have Lion Assistance 24 seven, um, and we have the Bright Squad. I kind of compare them to like the Geek Squad at, at uh, uh, you know Best Buy, they're 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 like computer and automotive technicians all wrapped up into one um, that can diagnose issues. Um, what's really important to to know about the service aspect of an electric vehicle? Um, there's not much service. A, a battery is not a moving part that requires service, and even the motor that drives the vehicle is not a serviceable component. It is a drop and replace motor that um doesn't really require any service throughout its life there's no oil there's no transmission um so there's just not a lot to do and anytime there is an issue we can diagnose it remotely and you know know how to fix that um sometimes before a customer even knows there's an issue uh, but we could also you know uh, just have a part ready and ready to go um you know at the moment there's an issue uh, rather than you know with diesel You've got to get a mechanic involved. They got to tear everything apart, diagnose the issue. We don't have to tear anything apart to diagnose issues, um, so it's great. We've also got uh, this kind of tells a bit more about it. I, you know, to cut down on time, I'll skip over that. Um, just kind of describe some of what I already met, mentioned. Um, now, getting into the specifics of our trucks, this first one here is the Lion Six. This is a Class Six, twenty-six thousand pound GVWR. Um, you can get up to 180 miles uh, on this truck with the battery configurations we have. That's and the largest battery pack configuration is 252 kilowatt hours. Now, um, I don't always suggest. Uh, you get a lot of customers say, "Just give me the largest pack, so I'm prepared for everything." It's not exactly that easy. Um, this is more of an engineered solution than than fleets I think are used to. You know, fleets often have bought one size fits all type of solution. Um, and, you know, for us, if you were to try to do that, you'd pay more than you'd want because batteries are expensive and also batteries are heavy. So uh, we really like to have a conversation first about, you know, what do you need the truck to do? You know, identify a route that we can we can do and then tell us about it. Let us know if it's got, um, uh, you know, excessive range requirements or anything and we can look at the largest battery packs uh but if you if the the route is not that long and um let's say you also had to carry a lot of heavy weight and you didn't want that extra battery weight then you know we'll put fewer batteries on it and make it a more affordable solution that can carry the most weight um so there's so a lot of things we can do um to make sure we're getting you the exact product you need. Now here's the, the next one is the Lion 8, and that's up to 60,000 pound GVWR. Uh, that's what we're putting the refuse truck bodies on today. Um, and that is like what a lot of the like roll off trucks and, and things have been to date. Um, this is also uh, a very big mover for, you know, a lot of our customers who have made commitments. Um, the Lion 8 is, is really their, you know, most common um, selection. Now we can get up to 170 miles on this truck, uh, up to 336 kilowatt hours. Now we've also got uh, the one I'm talking about on my one o'clock presentation tomorrow, the Lion 8T. It's a tractor um, that has a range of up to 260 miles, uh, up to 82,000 pound 
capacity for um, you know hauling, and then its uh, battery pack configuration goes all the way up to uh, 653 kilowatt hours. So uh, this is a really exciting product for us, and and I can't wait to give the presentation on it tomorrow. Um, Lion Six, here's another picture of it. Uh, you know, maximum power, you know, horsepower numbers, things like that. Um, all of our specs are listed here. And I can share this presentation because I know some of the things I'm going to go through pretty quick so that we're not eating into our question and answer time. Uh, charging type on the vehicle, uh, level three or level two. Um, but I will say most of the time we recommend level three uh, because I think that's uh, there's a well there's a lot of reasons we'd recommend level three but some customers don't have the power capacity at their facility for level three so we have a level two option as well um i wanted to show a quick video but i was having issues with this thing running this morning um and i i haven't corrected it so um i do have a link to our our demo um because during the pandemic it's been hard to get events together and have you know a bunch of people come check out our truck we've made videos that you know have people driving the truck shows the inside of the truck it's been kind of our uh, solution to not being able to do a lot of demos um i think we will have a demo to show a lot of people on the east coast by midsummer hopefully um just kind of depends on a lot of factors honestly uh part of that is opening up the border between canada and the us too i think so we will see, um, but I'm happy to share that that video with anyone who wants to see it. Uh, here is a little bit more information, um, you know, just on the different things we're putting onto a class eight chassis. Um, there's uh, the boom and the utility that are next year, uh, but the refuse truck, that's today. Um, this refuse truck, this line eight refuse truck is really, it's revolutionary um, for a couple of reasons. Uh, you know, one, the uh, body, it's fully electric. So um, that means that the body does not have any hydraulics on it. Uh, the lifting arm is an electromechanical arm. The compaction uh, is electromechanical as well. And um, the, the reason this is so revolutionary is uh, that the, uh, it, you know, historically, um, any kind of refuse truck application where you've got hydraulics running these things, that's a big service component. Uh, that's a, um, an issue with hoses bursting. Um, there's a lot of other factors, you know, pumps could fail for the, the PTO. Now we're not running a PTO. Also the, um, the other issue you have is that hydraulics waste a lot of energy. Um, that means you'd have shorter range capabilities if you're running a hydraulic body. So in eliminating the hydraulics, we've effectively given ourselves more range and more time and more compaction and more things that we can do instead of wasting energy on hydraulics. Um, now, that being said, we do um, still entertain putting on bodies that are hydraulic if that's a customer preference to have a hydraulic body we can put that on there. Um, and, you know, you'll see the impact on the batteries, but maybe you have a hydraulic body you love and that's what you want, or it's a rear load application where no, in the rear load application, there's not a, an electric body yet um, from any manufacturer. So uh, once there is, we'll be putting it on our truck. And uh, some other options here, you know, I mentioned that on the this refuse truck, we don't have a PTO. We can power, uh, uh, we call it an EPTO, an electric PTO power takeoff unit for like this bucket truck application where it is using hydraulics. But such an application does not use a lot of power because the the arm movement is, you know, it goes up and it's fixed. And it's not like in a refuse application where it's running and running and running and running every house. Uh, so we, uh, uh, there are, it's not as efficient to run hydraulics, but if it's, the hydraulics aren't used that much, it doesn't matter as much. Um, you can see we have got a reefer truck pictured here. Um, this is a, 
very hot product for us right now. A lot of people um, hauling food and, and stuff like that are, are interested in it. Um, I, I kind of went through the refuse truck, but here are more detailed specs that you know you may want to see when we uh, uh, when I share the presentation with everyone. But you can kind of see here we've got um, uh, what we say you know range and these kind of numbers. Um, we're taking into account things like heat. Uh, we assume you're going to use cab heat in a cold winter, and you can expect about four kilowatt per hour of operation. Uh, that's how much it's gonna go to your heat. That's kind of the uh, biggest factor that we, we design around is that you know heat consumption uh, during the winter uh, because that's, that's gonna have a big effect on how many hours you can operate or, or um, you know, what size battery packs we wanna put on to accommodate for that. Um, and so you know, that's why I like to go through a design uh, process with each of my customers and make sure that we're designing it perfectly for their operation. Um, I do have a video that works on our uh, side load refuse truck and I will show that to you here. Um, never mind. <laughs> it has failed. Uh, I opened up a separate window. Um, well, just ask me if you want to see it, I'll share it. Um, I think I have to figure out how to get that to work next time. But um, this, uh, there's some other things mentioned here. Uh, the electric body is less weight than a hydraulic body. So that's another big reason for switching over to um, fully electric bodies. Uh, this thing can do 1,000 to 1,200 cans per day uh, from what we've seen. Um, and electric versus hydraulic, I, I mentioned, it's so much more efficient, 50% uh, more efficient, actually. And oh, there we go. Uh, so this is the one I'm giving a presentation on tomorrow. Uh, kind of talked about it. We have uh, some of the same, you know, capabilities on the charging, you know, I think it's uh, some of this information is repetitive. Now the, the torque requirement, now this is our largest battery vehicle. So up to 536 kilowatt. Here's a list of our top customers, uh, Amazon, Waste Connections, uh, Hydro-Quebec, um, CN made a commitment of 50 trucks. Uh, we've got to update this because we just had our largest truck order uh, announced yesterday. There was an order of hundred trucks for uh, power sustainability. And um, they're gonna be deploying those across Canada and the US. So um, sales are really taking off. EcoMain was a big one uh, for us on the refuse truck side. They're a waste to energy facility that's, that's uh, made some purchases of the, uh, the ASL truck that I showed you with the fully electric body. Uh, here's what our instrument cluster looks like in the uh, interior. Uh, it can give you a lot of information, things like uh, the state of charge of the batteries, um, you know, high voltage status. So basically, you know, is the truck ready to be put in drive? Um, there's, uh, you know, energy consumption data, heater fuel level in case, you know, there's some customers who have very demanding um, heat loads, especially in the bus world. Uh, because you're heating a very large cabin. So in that case, sometimes they elect to go with a fuel fired heater just because they don't wanna take away from any of the range if there's a super cold day. So we've done that before. Um, there's just a lot of data we can, we can get onto this. And then uh, cab equipment, it's pretty standard to what you'd be used to in a conventional vehicle, MP3 player, Bluetooth. Um, we have the ODB port for onboard diagnostics, just like a conventional vehicle would have, uh, 12 volt DC and a USB port. We have uh, a reinforced cabin. Uh, this is very important for safety. Um, the, you can kind of see here where we've got high voltage disconnects. Um, so there's, I could really get in the weeds here talking about all of the uh, safety components and, and really how much thought has gone into the design of this. Um, again, we always say we don't just put things where they fit, we put them where they should go and where, you know, you'd want to see this. 
Um, we've also got uh, advanced uh, driver uh, assistance. Um, and excuse me one second, I've got transitions coming in. <laughs> Sorry, bear with me. I'm going to stop sharing and reshare because it uh, seems to have an issue. There we go. Now I got to get to the page I was on. There we go. Um, so active collision mitigation, this is something that we're able to do because we are an OEM making the vehicle ourselves, uh, blind spot detection. So this vehicle is safer uh, than your conventional vehicle. Uh, some of, uh, you know, we've got forward collision braking and we've got active braking, strong performance, even in poor visibility, because it's, it's using kind of a radar uh, to see vehicles. In oh, can I interrupt? It. Yeah, yep. I we get, you got the truck voucher incentive program on the screen? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay, so I just didn't know whether you were just talking. Oh, I'm sorry. Is that what is on here? Um, that's what that's me... what's on there. I, I, I knew you were talking about something else, and I just yeah. that you, know, you had the, 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 Thanks the for screenshot stopping. that I saw was a truck voucher. Okay. Thanks for stopping me, because I don't know why. Um, let's see. Let's try this again. Can you see the presentation now? Yep, that's the right one, I think. Okay. But it's, it's again, it's in two slides, so it's not full screen. All right. Um, seems like I'm having some issues. And now we get the truck voucher incentive program again. <laughs> <laughs> the other one at least had, you know, if you want to continue with the other one, it'll be on a smaller yeah. screen, but at least they'll have the right screens on it. Yep, um, I can get it fixed real quick. One second, just click stop share. And I think I remember if you get the other screen up that you had, I think it was. Okay, there you, there you go, it's, it's better. Yeah, I think if you go uh, display settings and then just swap presenter view and slideshow, you'll, you'll be good. There, yeah, fantastic. All right, so sorry about that. Um, we have the adaptive uh, cruise control system as well that will detect vehicles in front and behind. Uh, and then we've got more information on adaptive cruise. For those who are interested, um, I can share this full presentation and you can read a bit more about it. Um, lost a little bit of time with the technical difficulty, so I'm going to go through some of this, but we have lane departure systems, um, backup cameras, blind spot detection, uh, a number of safety features that are going to make our vehicles safer and like less accident prone for drivers, because um, we want to keep these on the road as long as possible. So. Um, this is kind of talking about the charging and infrastructure, level two and level three options that we have. We have uh, the grant team that we've discussed, and um, we have our, our Lion sales force that's just extremely focused on getting these heavy-duty vehicles that were diesel off the road and replacing them with our vehicles. Um, we have end-to-end -end infrastructure solutions. We have our Lion Academy that I discussed. Uh, Lion Beat. And uh, the other big thing to talk about is how much more productive our vehicles are. Uh, I mentioned that you know downtime is less because you're not tearing a bunch of parts off if there's something wrong. There's uh, You're not stopping for fuel 
uh, anymore because you have a station at your facility that is there um, for charging. You've got um, a lot of EV data you can get to really optimize your fleet usage. Uh, we've got all the assistance you could need uh, with our Bright Squad and 24 seven. We have an, uh, something that's really important to mention is an eight year battery warranty. Um, so, you know, it, I think this sets us above any conventional vehicle and electric vehicle maker because um, nobody's putting a warranty like this out there. We can even extend it to 12 years if a customer needs to, um, because we just are that confident in this vehicle, you know, lasting that long. Uh, I think a lot of refuse customers might be interested to hear about this because a lot of their vehicles haven't stood the test of time or, you know, in other vehicle applications, they haven't. Um, and they're definitely not getting a warranty that long on the vehicles they buy today. Uh, the uh, cold weather, you know, we, we kind of talked about that. And, and, you know, most of our deployments have been in cold weather Canada. Um, uh, we talked a little bit about the heating, you know, how much your vehicle could consume. Now, something you can do is preheat it while it's plugged in. Uh, that is something that will very much reduce your energy consumption for heating, especially on those really cold days. Um, and then I mentioned that we do have an auxiliary heater option. So sometimes we can, we can include that if it makes sense. Uh, we are the leader in the US. Um, no one is manufacturing vehicles this size in the US at, in this, um, you know, from cab to chassis to full vehicle. Um, we're really the one that has products on the road today that's, that's doing it. So um, here's my contact information. If you want to email or call directly, uh, please, uh, please do. And uh, that gives us about, what do we got? 20 minutes for question and answer. Great. Okay, wonderful. Thank you, Joe. Yeah. Um, we have another participant who's just joined us. So before we open up to question and answer, um, Todd, Matt, would you like to tell us where you're, which entity you're representing? Hang on. He should be, he needs, he needs to mute himself. I've, I've given everybody permission to talk so during a right. q and session. Yes, uh, is that Todd? Yes, it is. Okay. Where, where uh, are you I'm from, sorry? I'm, I'm basically just listening in, uh, representing the town of West Hartford, Connecticut. Oh, wonderful, great. Uh, so we actually, it looks like we have four towns uh, represented, plus we have a uh, waste management company, Payne's here. So we can open up to questions. Just before we get into questions, I just wanted to tell, tell Joe and everybody, we are planning on, on doing a traveling show of uh, zero emissions vehicles. So uh, Joe, if you're looking for a place to actually showcase these things, that could work for a lot of people. We could piggyback that or being as we're doing the work to try and get permission to get that to happen anyway, we might be able to make that work. And um, if you prefer to put your questions into chat, you can do that. Otherwise, um, if you want to raise your hand or I don't know how it works, I think make, raise your hand, uh, we can take your questions that way. So who has a question, Craig? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, yep. we can hear you. Oh, hi, Joe. Hi. Um, the, the, the question I have is, um, you've shown us and, and discussed a lot of the class six and eight, but in the beginning of the presentation, um, I think you had a class five that is available or going to be available or? Um, yeah. Um, so what what size vehicle or what, um, what, 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 you know, what can these um, municipalities or even the private sector, what, what size vehicle would that kind of, kind of fit? The five um, would just be, you know, I think the main reason for it is sometimes people don't want a class six vehicle. The wheelbase is too big or the box on it's too big or the, the bed on it's too big and they want you know the next size down. Um, and that's what the class five is going to give us. Um, but I will say it's not a huge market. There's not a lot of people with 
class five vehicles. Um, it's usually six or, you know, four or eight. Um, there's not a lot of seven and five, but it does fill a gap that, that we have currently. Um, and with a lot of the grants being replacement grants, um, it's kind of an important size for us to have because if a customer had a class five that they wanted to scrap and replace and get funded, they wouldn't be able to do it because all we have is class six. Um, so um, this, the five will help us kind of hit that space too so that customers don't have to go up a size and vehicle. I see. Okay. The, the five though will have the same configurations and the same stuff you can put on the back. I mean, boxes, stake beds. Uh, it gets a little more complicated if you're trying to do refuse or anything like that because it's really not, uh, I don't see a lot of packers, uh, trash packers going on a, a five. Um, and we honestly, we don't even do it for a six today. Uh, a lot of our auxiliary like specialized bodies are all going on the class eight. Okay. And then my last question would be, you had mentioned that um, there's plans to open up a service center in, in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. And um, do, do you have um, a part of Connecticut where that's being considered or a time frame? I don't. Um, I would suspect it's going to be around Hartford or near. Um, Amazon has a large facility in Connecticut. And um, I, I, you know, it looks like it's probably to align best with them um, because Amazon has certain things in their contract and, and things that, you know, the sale required that we have a facility uh, near them and, and have a replacement vehicle on hand in case anything were to go wrong. Um, they can just, you know, have access to whatever vehicle that we've got. So uh, that's part of the reasoning we're going to Connecticut. Um, Amazon is, is a, you know, big customer. So we got to keep them happy. <laughs> okay. Well, no, that's great. I, I, I actually live in Windsor and that's where their huge um, mm -hmm. facility yep. is and the second one that they're, um, that they're building now. So yep. great. Thanks. Mm -hmm. hey, we do have some questions in a Q and a, uh, the first one's from uh, Vincent Stetson. He's asking, uh, do you have any experience with these trucks plowing? That's a question that comes up a lot. Uh, we don't. Um, and I know a lot of people looking, want to be able to attach a plow to the front. There's a bit of a design hurdle there, I can tell you, just because uh, pushing snow requires a lot of force. We've got a motor with no transmission. Um, so planning, you know, it's, it's difficult. Um, a difficult design hurdle, I think, for now. Uh, now, give it a year, and I think you know, we'll probably have something like that where we can quote and say with confidence, yes, you can, you can push snow, but um, today we don't. And we, we don't say that because we also don't want to, our customers to do anything that would cause damage to the vehicle. So uh, we're not saying it's rated for it yet. You know, it, it could very well be, we just haven't done the testing. We don't know. No, we have uh, Michael Skakon. Uh, the hand raised. Mm -hmm. Hey, Joe, how you doing? Hi, good. Joe, um, I, I was looking at your vehicles. I don't see anything with hookless. Is that something that you plan on building in, in the future? Hookless. A hook lift? Oh, hook lift, yes. yes. Um, that's mm -hmm. something I think we'll have uh, again next year. Um, hydro, you know, are, are you looking for hook lift for like a roll-off application or it be a, a small roll-off uh, it can be used for a brine tank it can be used for a sander it can be used for a rack body okay uh, um, different applications i've made a note here uh mike and i because i think i have something i could show you um i'm not well scripted on the specifics of it but i think we sold we sold a roll-off truck in Canada that had a hook lift, so it has been designed, um, mm -hmm. but just that one, and it's very specific. But what I could do is I could pull some of those specs and, and send it over, and you can see, you know, what you think about it, and if you think that would meet your needs. Absolutely. I'd be very interested in taking a look at that. The other thing, too, I noticed uh, your facilities, you're based out of Canada, mm -hmm. and uh, you're looking to grow different areas in Massachusetts and in Connecticut. 
and you put down there your anticipated time would be 2022, I believe. How long does it take to build a truck, number one? And if it were to be built in the next year and a half, how would you support that truck by not being local? Okay, uh, good question. I, um, it it kind of depends on the truck we're talking about. Ones with that need a specific, uh, maybe complex body mounted on the back or hydraulics. Those will take a little longer um, because you've got lead time from the bodybuilder uh, putting it on there. Uh, but we can produce a class six or eight truck in about two to four months. Um, and then, you know, then when it arrives at the bodybuilder, you know, you've got their lead time of maybe two to who knows, six months. Uh, so, so some trucks, you know, might take a year to deliver. Um, some might take six months. Um, I'd say that's a good, good range, six to 12. I know it's a wide range, but we got a lot of different vehicle types. Um, as far as support now, uh, we, out of our Albany facility, we have service and, those technicians, um, I would almost, I, I tend to, and I come from a, a family of, you know, gear heads that, you know, work on vehicles in the shop and <laughs> like, uh, there's a big difference, I think, in the service aspect, because whereas people have always needed a place to take their vehicle and have the specialists work on it, we can often just show up, it's more like a, like a computer repair tech who's showing up and, uh, hooking a computer and doing the diagnostics. And then, you know, sometimes it's software related and you just put in a patch. Sometimes we can patch it, do the software patch remotely. So we don't even have to go on site. We can, uh, you know, do whatever fix that is required just over the air. Um, If it is an actual component that needs replacing, we know that it's uh, what that component is because we've remotely diagnosed it. And, you know, within a very short period of time, we're there with the part swapping it out. And it's not a lot of getting greasy and dirty. Um, It's really more like switching out uh, wires or, you know, connectors or um, that kind of thing. So it's uh, not as manual uh, on the labor and it's it's a lot easier. Um, So downtimes are are less than they are with diesel, even without us having a service network. And I often bring up Tesla as a prime example you know how they get such a big foothold in the u.s when they didn't have really dealerships or any service anywhere well it's because for the first couple years of owning the vehicle you don't really require anything um even brake changes are so few so um and then you can kind of let the the service network catch up uh with it so that's kind of how we're doing um you know as vehicles hit the road and we start getting orders in certain areas we see the need for a service center in that area and then mm-hmm. we make the, we make the plans to put it in that area to support it but uh, okay. we, can, we can handle a lot even without it right now so uh, we have a fleet of buses in white plains new york um for instance and now we've got you know the albany center but it hasn't required much checking in on them or anything yet okay i have one more question okay um- uh, computer chips, there's a computer ch- uh, chip shortage uh, worldwide right now, and it's backdating, uh, or there's quite a backlog on, on trucks, whether it be Navistar, Freightliner, and so forth. Mm-hmm. Uh, w- is that going to affect the vehicles that you're doing? I, you know, I've heard of this shortage, and I haven't heard a word from our company about it. I think... Um, more of more concern is charging stations and maybe that's part of what's affecting it um we've seen some long long lead times on charging stations uh there's a global shortage it's like five to six months sometimes to get the station uh that we that we spec most often so you know i haven't heard of computer chips i will say line is very very good at uh diversifying sources of things um even on the battery side uh on our trucks we'll use bmw batteries um that's one of our main you know batteries we're using on trucks today but we also manufacture our own packs and that's what we're using for buses and then we have other battery providers that we'll use for other trucks so um, we stay really well diversified so that we don't you know aren't so impacted by you know uh, supply chain shortages Okay, thank um, you. Can I just 
Thank you. Sorry, Mike. Uh, I just want to make sure we get to everybody before we finish. So we've got a few minutes left. Um, Julie Payne has a hand up, but Dodd, Todd Matt has two questions. Yeah, I think Todd he was Matt up before Julie. Yes. So Todd has uh, one question. I don't know if you want to ask it yourself, Todd, or if I should just read off here. Um, uh, the industry is leaning towards eight years or 100,000 miles of use at 70% recharge availability for the warranty. What is the replacement cost for a battery pack? I missed the first part of that. It cut out. Sorry. Uh, the industry is leaning towards eight years or 100,000 miles of use at 70% recharge availability for the warranty. What is the replacement cost for a battery pack? Well, I, I can't predict what it'll cost in eight years. Um, a lot less than it does today. Uh, by the time it needs replacing, it's going to cost a lot less. <laughs> but, uh, you know, battery packs today... Um, you know, for every, I'm trying to think of a price per kilowatt, uh, for basically what, like 40 kilowatt hours, you're going to pay about $20,000. Um, that's, uh, it's pretty expensive. I mean, it's, it's like 70, basically our battery packs, uh, dep if, depending on the size, uh, can make up 50% of the cost of the vehicle or more. Um, in the future, it'll probably be more like, 15, 20 percent. Uh, and it, it's part of the reason um, like we've spec'd BMW uh, on a lot of our truck builds because they're a manufacturer you know you can rely on to be around in eight years and be able to provide that pack in eight years. Uh, so that's that's uh, yeah, it's a tough one. Tough question. I don't know. You know, we know it's the price is going to go lower, but we just don't know, you know, what it'll be. Okay, thank you. Um, mm -hmm. Julie, would you like to? Hi there. Um, so the refuse industry is really hard on trucks in general. Mm -hmm. um, there, there's pretty much nothing that we do that isn't uh, uh, just difficult in general. Um, mm -hmm. So when you were talking about how many miles these uh, Class A trucks get, were you guys taking into account the hilly terrain of the area that we're in? Um, because pulling several tons that you're now put in a truck up a hill, um, how does that figure into the, the, the use on the batteries? Like, I know you looked at heat, but how mm -hmm. does the, the weight? Yeah, so uh, weight isn't as impactful as you'd think. I know on the, the diesel uh, application, it is because you've got to burn a lot of diesel to get up a hill. And then you, when you're coming down the hill, you don't recapture any of that diesel you burnt. Uh, when, uh, with electric, you will, will use a lot of battery power to get up a hill, but as soon as you go down it, the other side, you're, you're going to come down the hill, you're going to recapture a lot of that energy. Um, so mm -hmm. hills and, uh, and even weight are not that impactful, and actually, they can work to your advantage in the right application. If you were such that, like, your refuse route was, um, uh, let's say you're empty at the bottom of a hill, and at the top of a hill, you're full, uh, yeah. and then you're coasting down, you're going to have gain a lot more power um, than you really lost going up the hill. So it's actually a net gain. <laughs> um, you make it sound so easy. I, I feel like my yeah. trucks haven't coasted in a long time here. <laughs> now, uh, there's, it's not, you know, like we're going to get 100% of the energy back, but it is a nice feature of electric to know you're going to get some of that back. Um, mm -hmm. you know, and your momentum, the heavier you are, the more, you know, your momentum you're going to have for, you know, turning the motor when you're doing regenerative braking. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, also kind of wondering, uh, to switch over to electric vehicles, um, for a private business like us would require, uh, a redesign of our, our facility. Um, what is like the tipping point? How many trucks make it worse? redoing an entire facility you know do you, any idea because yeah uh, uh, these are not inexpensive things and to buy one and not get a cost benefit is is a hard thing to swallow mm -hmm. yeah um you know it kind of depends on the facility uh some facilities especially in port cities are very old and the electrical infrastructure is very old and just putting in one truck is a major headache and obstacle mm -hmm. you know uh, but some more modern facilities, you could put in, you know, a 
maybe five or six trucks and, and not have to have significant infrastructure upgrades. Um, that's where, you know, we get an electrician involved and we have a site survey done and, and kind of figure that out with you. Um, on what. Do you have a team of people? Yeah, we, so what we would do is probably have your local electrician go in and communicate with us because they'll mm -hmm. know more about local electrical code. Uh, and maybe even you have a personal relationship with the, your, you know, regular electrician who installed a, an HV, HVAC unit a year before or something. So we could, mm -hmm. we'd like to work with them. Uh, but w our team will then take the information they give us to spec out the right solution for that. And then I just have two other questions. Mm -hmm. um, unlike a class eight truck that uses up a pretty good amount of the battery, how long does it take to recharge that? Uh, this depends again on, I guess, how quickly you wanna recharge and what your infrastructure can support. Uh, you know, we can go up to 150 kilowatt charger, um, which could charge you in a couple hours. Uh, now, and it kind of depends on the truck size too and what battery packs we put on, what size those are. Mm -hmm. uh, but then we could go as low as, I guess the smallest DC fast charger is 24 kilowatt. And that's about, you know, an eight, eight to 10 hours, maybe if you had some large packs on it, um, which is fine for overnight charging. We want to right size. Everything's very important to right size, you know, right size the infrastructure. <laughs> don't don't uh, do more than you need to because um, mm -hmm. then you'll spend a lot more than you need to <laughs> yeah no uh, but we also want to future proof it that's why it's good to have you know conversations about it so we can make sure we spec it out correctly for the future as well um and then my last question would be when would you have a, a refuse vehicle to actually try out in this area because i'll be honest um unless I can really have one of my experienced drivers test this out um, to really get a feel for it because uh, safety and mm -hmm. reliability are huge. Uh, you know, it it's, looks great on paper, but a lot of yeah. things do. Yeah, 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 I, I get it. Um, the, uh, the demo we're gonna have here is just gonna be a straight truck without a um, refuse body on it. And mm -hmm. that's going to be this summer um, when we'll have one with a refuse body on the back. I'm not sure. Now, that's why I mentioned that, you know, if you, if you like the refuse body you've been using um, and it stands up to the wear and tear and you like that, then, uh, you know, you can use that, that same body and just put it on our chassis and, you mm -hmm. know, and then if you test our, you know, straight truck, then you've tested it. Uh, now, if you want to see that fully electric side loading body, what we did with EcoMain is we flew them up to Canada uh, and they checked out our facility. They saw the truck, they drove it. Um, mm -hmm. It was easier and less expensive than shipping a vehicle <laughs> to the U.S. and having it done there. So, so um, that, that is another thing we can look at. I also have some customers that are going to be getting these vehicles soon and hopefully some of them will be okay with, you know, showing it off to, to people. So we'll, we'll see about that. Okay. Yeah, that'll be great. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Did you have any more questions? Not currently. Thank you. Oh, thank you. And we have one more from Todd. What certification is needed by fleet mechanics to replace motors or other driveline components inherent to public works vehicles? So usually those kind of components, our techs would do that because um, we wouldn't want someone to, you know, go in there and mess anything up. It, it, it's an expensive vehicle, and those are some very key components on the vehicle. Uh, we so can Joe, provide. I, I gotta. I have to follow up with that. Okay. When I've got a fleet of a hundred vehicles that are uh -huh. out on the road daily, I, I can't imagine you've got enough techs that can come down and suddenly help me address six, eight trucks that are sitting in the garage waiting for some kind of maintenance. I mean, I know um, it's different because I'm not using high, I still got hydraulics. I've still got other things that are gonna break and go down. Uh -huh. Our guys can do that, but electrification, it's a little different. And so are my guys gonna be able to pop a wheel off and put a new regenerative unit in? Can guys, guys pull out a motor and replace it if I've got one on every axle? Um, you know, it's a good question. 
I guess we can look at something like that. You know, if, if uh, you have that kind of fleet and you want to have that flexibility, we can provide the training to, to make sure your guys can do it. Um, it. It really, I guess, depends on how comfortable you are and having, you know, because it, it's, it's less like being a mechanic and more like being an electrician. So if you've got mechanics who are really, you know, good electricians then, and can do a lot of electrical work, uh, and we can train them, then, then sure. I think it's, it's pretty easy work um, if, you're, if you're trained for it. All right. It's the future. We'll check into it. Yeah. Okay, um, okay so it is just past one o'clock. If anybody needs to leave um, or if you wanted to stay on for a few more minutes, uh, we, we can take more questions. Um, in the meantime, I have a couple of questions. And you do provide financial incentive. Um, well, not incentive. But you, you do give support, do you, to, to towns that are really serious about this or entities such as Payne's, um, you know, helping them find grants and funding um, to get us there. Is that correct? Would you provide that support? Yes. Uh, our grant team has a ton of experience winning grants. Most of our vehicles are on the road today because of a grant. Uh, so that is something we're very experienced at and we know, you know, how to find the right projects and find the right information from our customers to make sure that their, their grant application looks really good to the people who are deciding whether to give them the money or not. Um, and uh, we can help coach people up on getting that. Now, I, I always hesitate to push people towards grants because it does really draw projects out sometimes because you, there's a application process, there's uh, waiting to see if you're awarded. And then there's, you know, exercising the grant. And then there's a, like a lot of things tied to that. And um, I will say the vehicles without a grant pay for themselves. Now, I understand it's not great for most people's budgets, the up, upfront cost. It's just, you know, difficult. So that's where we really will work hard to get people grants if they have to have it. Well, especially if we're, we're talking about municipalities. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. just, everybody yes. got the same. Probably especially right especially today uh you know so yep yes. we are here for uh, all the support they need in applying for a grant we're experts and you know i think a lot of people shy away from the grant process because they look at it as a lot of work and don't have time for it it takes too many sign-offs um we handle it all we really handle it all and hand it in and it doesn't commit you to purchasing the vehicle it's just you know, a grant application. Uh, so if you get awarded and decide, you know, a year out um, that, you know what, it doesn't make sense now, you can walk away at no penalty. Um, we just, you know, haven't seen that happen very often because most people, once they get awarded, they say, yeah, let's go for it. So. Okay. I have a, a quick question about the, the, the batteries. Once they're no longer useful for these vehicles, there is another market for those used batteries. Is that correct? correct. Would you help partner, uh, let's say you've, you've got public works, you've got vehicles and their batteries are now, now need replacing. Would you help them find those other markets uh, or provide, you know, broker that so it, yeah, it's sure. almost like a trade-in. So sure. it's cheaper. Yeah. Yeah, we can help. Uh, we can definitely help them find somewhere to put that. Um, you know, I, I, and I, I thought of something that I didn't mention, you know, with our batteries and replacement, uh, that when we're sizing batteries for their application, um, we're always looking at worst case, you know, because we, we want to make sure that, you know, on the coldest day of the year with your, you know, longest route that you're, you're covered with the battery packs, right, and how they're sized. But customers rarely do worst case scenario. We're sizing the packs for worst case, but they don't use them for worst case. So that means the battery's lifespan, they'll, yeah, they outlive the vehicle. Replacements are very much, uh, very infrequent that you'd ever need a replacement battery. Um, so yeah, and then at the end of the vehicle life, you're gonna have these batteries that have a lot of useful life left in them. There's a lot of value in that. Um, that is also something that really makes a lot of sense on the return on investment. And I think demand for used batteries is, is increasing a lot. Um, so, you know, I think, uh, I think it makes a lot of sense. I mean, for home storage and microgrid, I wish I could find some, some used batteries. Uh, you know, I'll buy them off of you if, uh, if you've got them. 
And then just, I just have one more question. I don't see anybody else with a question or a raised hand, but I have one more question about, um, you're looking at Massachusetts uh, or Connecticut, Massachusetts border for um, service station. Is that correct? A service um, location? Yeah, but yeah. What about manufacturing? Any chance of getting some manufacturing in New England, Connecticut? I, I All I can tell you is, you know, and I, all of our investors, you know, <laughs> who contact me all the time would love to know this too. Um, but all I, I can say is it's been narrowed, and this is all I know, uh, it's been narrowed down to three locations in the US. Um, and that's it, that's all I know. <laughs> so- The manufacturing. Not, yeah, three, we have three different spots identified. Um, to me, a lot of places that, that make sense might be where, you know, uh, body manufacturers are located or, um, or demand is so you know I don't know I keep speculating on who uh, you know or where it's going to go and I don't I don't know so okay. wish I had more to share but we'll probably make an announcement in the next month or so so um, I'll let you know when I when we find out okay um, do we have any more questions or raised hands before we close the presentation nope we're good. Very good. Okay. So Joe, we'll, we'll be waiting to hear when you can get one of those vehicles down for us all to see in person. We'll, we'll make a space somewhere in one of our lots uh, and create an event out of that, or maybe even a traveling event for that. So awesome. uh, stay, stay tuned. And we will be continuing these presentations of getting zero emissions vehicles into our neighborhood. So everybody on this meeting, thank you very much for, for, for participating. And uh, we look forward to seeing you in future events. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.